are we ensuring that they're not using it in every single class for like 30 minutes in each class? Like if we're to stay in high school, for example, where there would be a one-to-one, -one, you can't really see you know, into each classroom. And I thought it was really interesting, the study that was done in the article titled um, The 17 Benefits of Using iPads in the Classroom. If you looked at the subject areas that used iPads the most, it, it was English and math and science. But if you looked at how the students were using the iPads, the lowest um, activities they were used were reading course materials, reading published texts, annotating articles, um, which are very, I mean, they're part of Common Core in almost across all of our um, subject areas. How are students be reading text, engaging with the text? And the highest on that of how students were using their iPads were um, researching online. What are they researching online if they're not reading published credible texts? So what are our students really using these for? Connecting with what Lauren was saying, I also noticed that the data provided was more so how students felt they were achieving success. It wasn't actually hardcore data that we could go off of. What were the actual numbers? How were they increasing the actual data? But well, seeing part of their that leads me to an important point, though. What we've learned this uh, last few days about the brain is that motivation and the neuroemotional connection to what you're doing helps that learning stick. So if the students are really motivated to use these iPads and that's a tool that's engaging them in their task, then will you overlook that or not use that tool? I think feeling comfortable and motivated is wonderful. Like it's such a, I mean, it mentioned the connection with the brain, but bottom line is we still want to see improvement if I'm placing an iPad in front of a student and I want to see I can still make you feel good and comfortable with that thing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about feeling good. That goes back to Susan talking about that increased dopamine tolerance. It takes more and more to feel that motivation or drive to do something or happiness when creating a project. And I just I think that was really startling when she said that because that makes sense. People, you know, the search kids will search for higher and higher stimulation of things. And what happens when we can't give them that? We expose them to so much of the technology in every class for, you know, even if it is for 15 minutes per class period, I feel like it'll be hard over time to wean them off of it versus maybe getting entire districts on board with sharing that balance perhaps, but that's so hard to regulate. I also think it's important though that that's why the variety that's used, like there's so many different apps and, and uh, creations we've got there, but then it's our job as educators to facilitate that they're doing different things and they're not doing the same thing all the time and so that they're that dopamine high is being met so that they are still um, differentiating how they're using the iPads um, in each of their classes. So it, like I understand what you're saying about the balance. I agree with that and I agree with that. But for a student who can make an iMovie instead of writing a paper to show how they've learned a concept or for a student who can make a concept map drawing a picture because the motor skills or whatever the problem may be, how do you compensate for that without the iPad or without technology? I think the question could be completely flipped around. How do you compensate for their lack of knowledge of how to write a paper if all they can do is a tiny thing? I think it, again, it just kind of boils down to do the benefits truly outweigh you know, the negatives? Like actually figuring out, like, is this one project that this child can make that's using technology and specifically for them, really outweighing all of the social things that they have lost, all of the ability to communicate and um, potential health risks that iPads and everything with technology. I agree with that and I would take it further and say what is our goal as educators? Is it to prepare students to be global citizens and that somebody here living in Olathe may be working for a company in Bangkok because they, they are on technology and they know how to use the iPad, their Apple Watch, and whatever to, you know, have FaceTime with somebody and do a presentation and be able to put something together literally in 10 minutes in their car or on the subway. And so we have to think about making, making sure that our students, when they graduate and they go off, are able to compete in that type of a reality because that's the reality of where we're at in today's society. And I can just agree with what you're saying when I think of like everything primary and that the penmanship, being able to write and pick up a book and uh, the basic skills of what it looks like to hold it and read a book, you know, some of those things that I think that some teachers overuse technology in their classrooms, but those kids might not have those skills. One thing that I don't think we've touched on yet that I'd like to address is the flipped learning. 
classroom and apply it there in the classroom. I, I don't think that requires too much time of them, but without that tool, we wouldn't be allowed that time as a teacher. I know I've 